Good morning and welcome to another exciting edition of Day 4 with the man Frank Scalish. I believe this is Day 4, 157. I don't think, I can't even count that high. Well, I think I might have mixed up a day or two. I'm trying, I got to go back and organize that. I think it's 157. That's, I, I'm, I'm down with that. I'm, Apparently I'm everybody in the comments is watching where it's snowing. Yeah. Wisconsin, I mean, Indiana, all sorts of places. Yeah. Well, uh, we're getting, we're getting throttled. Um, But here, I mean, we're cold. We're not snowing yet. Now we're supposed to get a little rain mix, but um, we have literally had just like nothing but rain for the last probably four days. Well, that can't be good for the spring fishing. Well, they some of the my steelhead buddies are are sending me pictures of the rivers, and that dude, it is they are like blown up, like they're in the woods, they're muddy, they're ripping, um. You know, as usual, um, I have a little spring thing that I really like to do here. And, and of course, again, it's it's blowing it out. So, so oh, well, <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, it's a it's a specific little smallmouth bite that happens here in the spring. And um, it's it's not working right now. The water do, so uh, high do the steelhead go up in there even when it is nasty? Like, I mean, is that like a, a is that a biological thing where like it's yeah. this time of year? It doesn't matter if the rivers mud or in the trees. It's just impossible to target them. No, well, they can't see anything. Um, the the reality of it is, is high water episodes get a push up steelhead, um, and then during that, here's a, here's a trick to all you steelheaders out there. Not that not that you want to. You know, not if you're not a steelhead fishing guy, just listen anyway, because it's interesting. So the, the high, the high muddy water episodes push these steelhead into these small feeder streams, tiny little feeder streams, pretty much drainage ditches. OK, and they'll run all the way up these things to get to where the water's cleaner. Of course, as the water recedes, the steelhead pull back and they go back to the main river. But these high water episodes that when I was guiding for steelhead back in the day, um, we would float these guys down these flooded in the rivers when they get high and muddy, they're narrow and steep banks. And they, it's a torrent of water in some of them. Um, we would float boat down these rivers and we would get into the mouths of the feeder streams and we would fish them in the feeder streams and a lot of these streams you could literally jump across i mean they're not wide um and that's what happens so like on these real crappy steelhead days a lot a lot of guys don't have really good luck well first of all the the cfs is way too the rivers are way too fast um and very dangerous to wade um so so what happens is the guys that do venture out usually don't catch much but when you jump up these feeder streams it's they're totally fishable and you catch them because huh. this, all the steelhead are running up these things um so it's pretty it's pretty wild there's a there's a faction of great lakes smallmouth that will also migrate up the rivers to spawn um it happens in all the great lakes and it's weird because they behave just like a steelhead or a salmon. They run up the rivers to spawn. And, and usually when I was guiding for steelhead later in the spring, as the steelhead would start falling back to the main lake, these small mouths would start running up. Mm -hmm. So you, you'd get an overlap. You'd be swinging streamers and you didn't know if you were going to get a four pound small mouth or a, you know, nine or 10 pound steelhead. So, so it was kind of really, um, yeah, I know. Sorry, Nick. <laughs> Sorry, bro. But um, yeah, I mean, so you just never knew what you were going to get. Uh, it was a, and it is a really fun uh, time mm -hmm. to fish. So last year I got out um, early, not steelhead fishing, smallmouth fishing and absolutely railed them. And then the mud line, as I was going up the river, I was fishing my way up the river. As I was going up the river, the mud line was coming down. As soon as the mud line got to me, it, the bite was done. It was over. And then it, it literally rained for five consecutive days in a row and just smoked the river out. 
<laughs> it was over. You know what I mean? Because once they go up in the, the, the first run of fish that comes up in the early spring, they're ganged up. They come in in school. So you get them in waves. Once they get up there and they spawn and they start falling back to the main lake, they're, they're trickling down in, you know, onesies and twosies. They're not really, um, they're not concentrated. Mm -hmm. So the fishing is much more difficult. Um, you don't catch near as many. Um, you got to really work for them at that point. And by then the largemouth are turning on. So you're catching a lot more largemouth. So it's, it's really a unique fishery. All these estuaries on the Great Lakes, they're very unique fisheries. Um, and and uh, I can only liken it to fishing in the intercoastal when certain saltwater species are running. You, then you've, you're fishing and you're catching them, you know, in the intercoastal because they're running through the system. Um, and that's kind of how it is. So it's really interesting. And it's, it's, it's kind of mind-blowing to me how... These fish will move up these estuaries and rivers way before the main lake fish start staging on their pre-spawn areas, which is really wild to me. Um, because if I the water temperature, I mean, we're we're still talking almost winter water temperatures, and so it's really amazing to me how this just this certain faction of bass make these movements. And then the other ones don't. Um, it's really, it's really kind of wild. Uh, it's really interesting to me. That is, that is true. I mean, I'm sure that's part of na nature's preservation to where if every, if they all did the same thing and then something catastrophic right. happened at the same time, then you lose entire year classes of fish. So I don't, I know guys have talked about that, about this different spawning cycles right. of that. Cause if every fish spawned at the same time. So yeah, that is interesting though. Like it's almost like that homing instinct, like you see out of the salmon or something. Yeah. I wonder if the same fish go up in there every single year, or if some years, some go and some years, some don't, or I, I think, think honestly, I think the ones born in the rivers go to the rivers. Yeah. The ones born well, on the main lake stay on the main lake. For those who are asking, I saw a couple of steelhead is basically a lake or ocean run rainbow, rainbow trout that goes up the river to spawn. But unlike a salmon, they go back out into the ocean or lake, then they don't die. Right. The steelhead will spawn and, and go back to the lake or ocean and live. Uh, so will the brown trout. There's a lake run brown trout and an ocean run brown trout that live in the salt water their whole lives. And then they come up to the, you know, like you know, in, on the East Coast and the West Coast, they live in the ocean and then make their run in the Great Lakes. They live in the Great Lakes and come from the Great Lakes and make their run. Um, and steelhead are crazy, dude. They, they can go 90 miles in a day. They can For those who haven't caught it, like you said, if you're a the, basically... So there's two types of steelhead fishermen. There's rational steelhead fishermen, and then there's steelhead fishermen that are just like us in the bass world, where right. they live, eat, breathe, sleep steelhead. They they call. I mean, they are one of the most yeah. obsessive groups that I've ever been around, and I say that almost you know as a compliment, just as as right. A, I mean, there's a lot of some guys that you know you do the spinning rod with a, a cork or a float and you there's all, all different ways and then you've got the right. purest steel headers like i've done it up a like lot. the anchor river in alaska where if you get a spinning rod within a, a hundred yards of them i mean they think you're the devil right exactly they, and it's true i mean i guided i guided my trips were uh, fly fishing guided trips although if a guy was a conventional angler and didn't know how to fly fish if he didn't want to learn how to fly fish we guided him conventionally um you know with with noodle rods and mm -hmm. they don't really call them bobbers they call them strike indicators yeah yeah yeah, yeah you yeah. know you know the drill i mean it's it's a flipping bobber but anyhow <laughs> um <laughs> but anyhow so you know so my we would we would this was cra this is crazy this is way off topic but yeah there is no such thing as off topic okay so so when we guided okay we would go out and recon the rivers because you have to see where the major how far up or how far close to the mouth are the majority of the steelhead mm -hmm. so when you run a trip because a lot of times they're wading trips and guys can't guys can't wade big distances in these rivers 
um, a, it's, it can be brutal. Um, and B, no, everybody thinks they walk way farther than they walk. Like, like I've got a weightable section that's about three miles long. And some guys will be like, dude, what did we do? Like 20 miles. <laughs> and you were like, no, we're only halfway done. We only went a mile and a half. You know what I mean? They don't ha- they can't equate that distance. Mm-hmm. Um, and then we float guys down in float boats where you, get past the crowd every access point on a river there's going to be a big crowd and you get past that crowd and you get i don't want to say fishing that is unpressured um because by the time they get up the river they've been thrown at five hundred thousand times but you get places where the anglers aren't constantly in and out of the water um and so we would float guys down. And then, of course, on a float trip, you could cover seven or eight miles relatively easily. Um, and so that's what we did. But at night, we would recon. And the recon days were a lot of fun because, you know, we'd backpack beer, bring our fly rods, catch a few fish, drink some beers, cook food on the bank, you know, with a little hibachi grill. Um, We had a pretty good time. And then at night we would tie flies for the next day. Once we figured out what they, what patterns they were eating or what colors they wanted, we would go back to the fly shop and we would tie flies like madmen. And then we, you know, cause you, you don't want to ever run out of, Mm -hmm. you know, just like bass fishing. If you got one crankbait and you lose it, and you're catching fish on it, you're kind of screwed. So it's the same, it's the same case in point. And, and I, I've met guys from all over the world, uh, cause our steelhead fishing is world-class. And so I've met guys from England that would come over. I guided them, you know what I mean? Guys from British Columbia, guys from, from just all over the place. And, um, and it was a lot of fun. I met a lot of really interesting people, but I learned a lot. You know, like one day I was out there, it was the middle of January. We had three or four feet of snow. All right. And I can see the steelhead underneath parts of the frozen river, right underneath the ice flow. So I would go out and bust all the ice up and push it downstream and then wait about a half an hour. And all the steelhead come right back to where they were. And then we would catch them. You know what I mean? And then, and then. I was sitting there tying a tie, tying a um, an egg pattern on for a guy, and I was in the snow, and I it was deep, and I just I like plopped my knees down in it, so the snow was like a, a little bench for me while I was tying the guy's thing. And here come all of a sudden, I see out of the snow, I see do 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 this little thing coming up, and here it is, it's like a stone fly, and he's coming out of the snow, and I looked really? around, yeah, I looked around, and there was a whole bunch of these, you know, little legged critters coming out of the snow and i said holy crap we got to do a fly switch right now and and then put stone flies on and then the guy started whacking them on stone flies you know what i mean so it was it was really cool i didn't even know they came out in the winter but they did and they were walking on top of the snow and everything it was pretty wild so you you learn you learn a lot i know so i've hooked some ocean run ones and they go absolutely mental when you hook them i mean scream and drag up and down oh, yeah. not three or four jumps seven eight jumps what is it the same in the on the lake run steelheads too 100 percent, dude you you hook a good one and you're running downstream after it because yeah. you, can't, you can't put the brakes on them um they go say start running down current and you can't you can't stop them because two things usually they're between nine and 14 pounds and they got the current in their favor and they're trucking downstream and you are flying after them. Um, I had one on one day. This is the funniest story. So um, I use, I Powell rods used to be a fly rod company. That's all they made was fly rods. So I had, I had a bunch of Powell rods that I, that I use on my guide trips. All right. In fact, I helped him work on a switch rod, which a switch rod means you could swing streamers with it or you could egg a nymph with it. OK, so it had double duty on the river. So I can only, I could bring one rod and I can cover a few techniques. Mm-hmm. So I had all these switch rods made and those were my guide rods. A friend of mine owned a fly shop 
and he goes, Hey dude, I'm, I'm, I got a bunch of sage rods. I'm going to blow them out because they're discontinued sages. And I'm like, dude, I'm not, I'm not spending $900 on a fly rod. You can forget it. He goes, no, dude, you, I, I, he goes, you don't have to. So basically he almost gave me the rod. All right. So I bought it and I was, I was fishing with it. When I got it, I rigged it up and we went out, we were fishing. There was a good run of steel. in. So you got to remember, this is like a $900 rod. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, and I, and I never fished with it before because I always use pals. So, <laughs> so anyhow, dude, I hooked this monster. I hooked this monster steelhead and it starts going and it, and I have to run downstream with it because I can't put the brakes on. So I'm running downstream with him, and he jumps, he's porpoising, poof, poof. He's not doing that like mm -hmm. normal. He's porpoising, poof, poof, poof. Dude, there's a fallen tree. He goes underneath the tree and keeps on trucking. And I got, I got the rod and, and he's underneath the tree and I'm looking and there's, I can't get, there's no way to, for me to get yeah. the line out. I, I literally, I put the rod in the water. I drop it in the water. I run on the other side of the tree grab the fishing rod and i'm running downstream i landed the thing it was almost 15 pounds i was i was laughing my buddy looks at me he goes dude you just threw your sage in the river i go yeah dude i i would have <laughs> lost the fish you know what i mean so so yeah that's, it's, that's it's, a good story yeah was, they, they were we had so much fun doing this stuff i mean we really did but but it's but it's you learn you learn so much like like the the whole the whole key um to fishing is learning all right yeah chocolate milk dude that'll kill you that'll kill you uh, on steelhead but the whole key to fishing is learning and so um the more things you learn even about other species the more it tells you about the species you're chasing you mm -hmm. know what i mean like like when i learned and i learned a long long time ago about smallmouth that run up the rivers because um i grew up fishing the rivers so i knew this was an this was a real thing and so you know where a lot of guys didn't know that it existed um and so you just you learn a lot and 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 in this industry if you're if you're not willing to accept learning you stagnate and you flatten, you, you plateau. I mean, essentially, um, you're just not going to grow as an, you won't grow as an angler. Mm -hmm. So here, so, um, this is crazy, but it's the same thing with the forward facing sonar game today. Um, and I'm not going to get into the ah, ah, ah about it. I'm just going to tell you the facts about it. Um, there's guys that literally hate it think it shouldn't exist there's guys that love it and think it's the greatest thing in the world okay but as an angler you have to you have to accept it because what because you you'll stagnate okay so in the beginning like everybody that watches this show knows that i've only been messing with forward facing sonar for last season and the beginning of this season, all right? I'm intrigued with it because I'm learning a, a ton more about the fish. Now, you all know because of the last few episodes, I said for the first time I got it for practically the whole year, all I did was crappie fish off of it mm -hmm. because I needed to learn. I needed to learn about what's 30 feet away from me what's 40 feet what's 50 feet um am i too far to the left am i too far to the right w what fish is going to be active what fish isn't going to be active when do i quit trying to get this one and just go catch that one um and so the crappie were easy to learn that on because they're very they're very they 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 comply really easy receptive I mean, yeah if you if you have the right color on they're going to smoke it so, so that's how I learned about using the behavior of what I'm seeing on my screen. If they're coming up 
and going away, coming up and going away. I got two problems. Either I'm too, my color's wrong, all right, or I'm too heavy with the jig head. So I learned this just by crappie fishing. And, and so then I would switch colors and then all of a sudden I drive and boom, and they would smoke it. And I go, yeah, that's the color of the day. And, and I had done this on this one lake and literally went back the very next day with the color that I was killing them on the day before they wouldn't even touch it. Most of the time they'd come up and not even get close. You know how, you know how, when you see the glowing fish and they come up and the two glow dots intersect each other, you know, that in a minute you're going to have one. Mm -hmm. Hey, wait, wait, I've learned so much because I said, I was kind of some puzzled and I left and I figured out a couple of things to the way this goes. Oh yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah. I'm just throwing up a couple comments. Yeah. So I, I try to read them, but I can't focus. I can't do both. So yeah, and, no, yeah, but yeah, I just put them up there for the listeners. I'll, I'll I, star I, it if we need, can need to come back to it. Gotcha. So, so at, at any rate, so, so, I went out and they'd come up and they would, they would get close, but they wouldn't even get in the same plane as the, as the, the, um, you know, the baby shad, they would come up and just go down, come up and mm -hmm. go down. I said, Oh, I got to change colors. And I went to a completely the day before I was throwing pure chartreuse, chartreuse pearl. That day I had to throw semi-transparent, 100% natural to get them and mm -hmm. and no conditions changed nothing changed but i learned this okay um i learned this so when so now as i start to apply this to bass fishing i i've already i'm already learning some things okay that that i can translate into bass fishing so here again fishing for something else is making me better at bass fishing. And so, Matt, you said something. We were talking about forward-facing sonar, and you said something. You said that um, my my traditional, my instinct style of fishing is going to suffer at first. And I 100% didn't believe you. I'm like, there's no, dude, come on. You know what I mean? I've been fishing instinctively my entire life. That's never going to go away. Well, here's what happens. Frankie and I decide we're going to go do this. We're going to go forward face. And all we're going to do is forward face. And we picked a lake that neither one of us has ever seen in our lives. Mm -hmm. Like ever. I went down there and I scoped the whole day. And it was the most frustrating day of my life fishing. And when I got off the water, I was so pissed because I'm like, all I had to do is get speed ends and get wiggle warts and go throw them on these 45 degree rocky banks. And we would have probably caught them. We would have caught them um, because what we were chasing were we were chasing shad, crappies, um, walleye. You know what I mean? I mean, everything but what we needed to be chasing. And so it was so frustrating for me. And I and I said to myself that that is the first and the last time this is going to happen to me because especially this time of year, which is, which is what we're going to talk about this time of year. Um, um, especially this time of year, because I found myself, I'm fighting, I'm fighting against what I've done my whole life to learn something new. And I'm not, I'm not getting a good marriage of both together. Okay. Um, and so what I'm, what I'm realizing is that in order for me to become a, become better and more efficient with my forward facing game, I can't abandon my instinctual fishing knowledge because that's what got me here. And so I have to find a marriage where I can use the two together until the two don't apply, meaning winter, and summer when the bass get off the structure and start running shad all day. So, so I'm, I'm, I've learned that now, you know what I mean? I've, I've, I've learned that. So, so that's kind of, you know, kind of where I'm going with this. Um, and before I get into, uh, before I get into this time of year and how it's going to be an advantage to you guys and Matt, you, you could pump in any time cause you have way more experience than I do at this game, but I'm going to tell you my take on forward facing sonar. So, um, you guys, people could yell at me. They could scream at me. They could agree with me. They could disagree with me. I don't really care. 
because this is the truth, okay? As a professional tournament angler, you have to adapt to forward-facing sonar. So you can continue to fish at your highest level. If you fail to adapt or refuse to adapt, you're literally shortening your professional tournament career because it is here and people are utilizing it. So as an angler, as a professional angler, you must grow with the technology or you're smoked. I would tell you that you would be hard pressed to find any pro that doesn't have forward facing sonar and or 360 or both or 2D sonar because in the old days, you know, we we didn't drag minnows, we drug four and five inch Kalen grubs on jig heads underneath 2D sonar before the Demiki rig ever was a thing. In fact, that's how I won Buffalo. I was, I was fishing. You a were yum, moping. Uh, yeah. I was fishing a yum dinger on a jig head and a, and a eerie darter on a jig head. And, and I, and I was literally on top of the fish. Now I could be on top of them cause they were 38 to 42 feet deep. Mm-hmm. So I could be on top of them without, without, you know, spooking them. And I, I almost saw every fish I caught, you know, until the waves got to be 12 footers. And then I had to, you know, throw a hundred drift socks out. And then I was just dragging over the fish where I knew they were not, not bouncing bottom, but you know, higher up in the water column, but, but at any rate, so, so you have to embrace it or you won't succeed as an angler, just an average everyday guy, like you and me as an angler, you also need to embrace this technology so you could continue to grow as a fisherman. You will learn more about bass behavior. The more you, and, and you're going to learn about bait fish behavior because you're seeing it. And so, so if you want to become a better angler, the more you know about the environment, the more you know about the bait fish, the more you know about the bass, the better angler you're going to be. So it's not a matter of this is wrong, this is bad, this is good, this is great. It's a matter of as an angler, your end goal is to catch fish. And so you want to be the best you can at it. So you have to adapt to this new technology because it's here. It's here. I mean, are you going to go out today and buy a black and white television set? I don't think so. Are you going to put your cell phone down for a landline? I don't think so. Um, There's pros and cons with everything in life. You have to take it and find that silver lining that fits you the best and, and use it. Wow. That was that. (laughs) That's well said. So, I'll piggyback on what uh, on what you said, but for 157 episodes, we've done day four with Frank Scalish, entertain, educate, and engage. And you've done hundreds of uh, diagrams and contour lines and maps and lures to increase it. Uh, I do know that we do have some of the top level anglers that listen to day four, but I'm just going to go out on a limb and say that 99.99% of guys in the covet section right now do not make a living bass fishing. They work their ass off all week. Right. And I'm talking to the 250 plus people in here right now. You have a passion for a, a sport or an activity that gets you up in the morning, that gives you something to look forward to. And you're watching this show so you can become a, a better, well rounded angler. And you don't have to have. 75 units and nine transducers you don't have to have it but if your goal is to understand what is happening under the surface of the water better it it is a fantastic tool to use as you choose to use it as you don't choose to use it you don't have to do it 24 7 you can but what you can learn based on applying what you've learned from day four and your own experiences it in my opinion 
it enhances, there's the word exponentially, it enhances your experience exponentially when applied properly. Here's what gets me. Frank, I'll call you out. You're 60 years old. You've been yeah. doing this. You've been fishing. You've been doing this. Heck, My entire photo life. Is your entire life. It is, it is refreshing for me to see how open-minded and how excited you have gotten over the last year and a half about finally being able to get a glimpse and it's not like it's a damn picture underwater we're looking right. at 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 a at a eight at a six to eight degree beam that you're seeing that then you have to learn to interpret but it has been awesome it has been awesome to watch you call excited and say well, I learned this today, or these fish are located here for all this time. I thought they were located here, or this confirmed what I thought was happening with the fish are, are on the bottom during these conditions, or or I, I would never have looked in, in this area. And that explains, just like we talked about in the classic a couple of weeks ago, when we had the classic episode, and yeah. you said, man, I was wondering where the hell those fish went when the water dropped. Now you're able to observe, to learn, to see this thing. And you're moving forward as an angler. You're excited yeah. about it. And you're not saying, well, damn, I've been doing this for 40 or 50 years. I paint crankbaits. I talk about jigs. I talk about stuff that's just going to be the downfall that forward facing sonar is going to be the downfall of this. You're, you're, you're excited. You're learning more about fish habitat behavior than you ever had. You're applying your history of knowledge at it. And every time you hit the water, you call me and it's like the most exciting time you spent on the water. Yeah. Because, because I, I, I'm like a, I'm like a sp sponge. I'm, I'm like a sponge when it comes to fishing knowledge. I want as much as I can have. Um, no, I, truth be told, I don't compete on the professional level anymore. In fact, I don't even fish local tournaments anymore. I just fish and I love bass fishing. Well, I actually, I love all fishing, but I, but I addicted to bass fishing. So the more, I just want to learn as much as I could possibly learn. I want to be so knowledgeable, but accurately knowledgeable, not mm -hmm. someone told me something. So I'm going to repeat it because I don't repeat anything that someone told me unless I experience it on my own, because I can't prove it unless I do it. So so, so this is what's exciting to me, uh, you know, about it. Um, I'm also finding out that um, I'm looking for the happy blend. You know what I mean? Where mm -hmm. I can use, I always have it on. Always. I always have it on. This, this winter, um, it put a lot of extra fish in the boat for me. Um, I wasn't out in the middle of the lake going, you know, scope and uh, mm -hmm. all around the middle of the lake. That's not what I did. Um, I don't have to do that in the winter, on, on, especially on a lot of the lakes that I live on. Okay. Um, because I know where the fish are wintering. I know where they're at, but I, I use it and I was fishing a jerk bait and there's a, there's a lot of grass and you can't see bass in the grass unless they come out of it. It, depending on how thick it is, if it's real thin and sparse, you can't, but, mm -hmm. but depending on how thick it is, you can't really see them. So I would, I would go over to this area, throwing the jerk bait, throwing the jerk bait. And I'm like, man, I should have been catching them. I don't understand. So I make my pauses longer. Um, I shake it a little bit more, maybe longer pauses. All of a sudden I see, I, I see one come out of the grass. And then he goes back down. Another one comes up and goes back down. I go, it's either size or color. So I start switching jerk baits up. Next thing I know, I throw it out there. I do the long pause shake thing. And this thing just goes and gets it like it, like it wanted it. And, and then I, so I'm like, Holy smokes. You know what I mean? So it helped me dial in on a color. It didn't help me dial in on the area because I already knew the fish should be there. But it helped me dial in on the color. It helped me dial in on the cadence. How fast do they want it moving? How slow mm -hmm. do they want it moving? It gave me clues to narrow this thing down even quicker. And to be honest with you, I didn't hardly scope that day. And I caught some monster bass. 
I just, I always have it on because you never know. There's going to be that one time you're going to go move and you're going to scan over a brake line and you're going to see a couple. And so that's put, that's two more that I caught that I would never have caught. You know what I mean? Um, so it's the enhancement of everything that excites me about it. One of the things that has not been talked about is how everyone talks, uh, about this in a different way, but I think that forward facing sonar and watching videos of people using forward facing sonar on YouTube, especially with the screen can right. massively help anglers who are fishing from the bank anglers who don't have forward facing sonar. There's a lot of people that, that still don't have it. A lot of uh, day four fans that don't yeah. have it, but it's what I've learned expensive. Especially, you know, I, I've fished a week in Mexico without it. And you get in the back of your buddy's boat and, and, and if he has it and you don't have it, you're not and you're not up there looking at it. You're just fun fishing. But what you can learn from that is you mentioned that jerkbait cadence before when you're not seeing how the fish is reacting to, to a bait on there, how it's t turning around, how you you watch the cadence and you learn what gets those fish to react and you're like look at how like every time you start popping it really quick or during this time you're so you can learn oh okay if there's a brush pile here look on forward facing sonar how much little things are around brush piles and things so now you're like if you don't have forward facing sonar you drop a buoy on a brush pile you're like dude i'm going to i'm going to make some fan casts 30 feet mm -hmm. to the side because i know based on what we've seen on this, there's a lot of fish that will loosely relate to, uh, to brush, but not actually be in the brush. 100%. So, you know, if you're just fishing a long point or a secondary point, and you're, you're watching guys forward facing sonar moving up, how many of them are catching fish in open water at certain times of the year. Now you can stop a hundred, a hundred feet, a hundred yards further, pick up a small swim right. bait and work your way up to the point. It's you're still learning, even if you don't have it, but what you're taking is the information that is available. The plethora of information that is available, on the internet, on the videos, on the tutorials, and it's still helping you catch fish even if you don't have it because whether you like it or not, it's teaching us an incredible amount of knowledge about what is going on underneath the surface of the water that we've never had eyes on before. Right. There's no question. And, and my, and, you know, when, when I fit, and I'm going to just call it conventionally, when I, when I'm fishing conventionally, 2D sonar, side imaging, just the normal stuff. Um, early in the spring, I always started out and worked my way in because I never knew where the fish were going to mm -hmm. be. I knew the fish were out there. I knew that, you know, I already knew that from past ex fishing experiences. And so I would approach my cover from uh, off the cover to the cover. Smallmouth taught me. Smallmouth are the ones that actually taught me that just because the rock piles here doesn't mean the smallmouth are here. They could be over there. They could be up here. They could be over there. That's that's why I used to do so good on the Great Lakes because I wasn't so focused on you know so fine tunely focused on my rock pile. I knew those smallmouth used it because I found them on it. Mm -hmm. But if they're not on it, does that mean they disappeared? It no. It means they're using it, but they're relating to it, you know, somewhere around it. And so then I would make, I would start making my fan casts and tooling around with my 2D sonar until I found them. And then once I found them, I would go vertical on them. All right. Um, so I knew that behavior, but now it saves me time. All right. Because now I can just go there and go, okay, they're over there and go over there. Um, so it's, it's a time saver for one. Um, it didn't tell me something I didn't know, but it's making it easier on me. Um, and, the, and with largemouth fishing, um, I knew the largemouth suspended certain times of the year. Uh, I, if you guys remember, I did a jigging spoon show and I specifically referenced Kerr Reservoir. All right. Um, how the fish in later in the summer, after they get off the structure and start really mm -hmm. concentrating on the bait fish, because we know the bait fish are concentrating, getting together to go up the creeks in the fall. So, so as those bait fish start to conjugate together on these deep creek channels, they're literally in the main lake, um, but they're the creek channels that will run up that specific creek arm. Um, we would get over top of them with jigging spoons, 
and vertically jig through the balls of shad because the bass are always usually underneath them unless they're slashing through them which you can also see on 2d sonar um and then get the jigging spoons just below the shad and then you pop it up and let it go down so it looks like an injured one you know falling through the bait fish and the bass come up and get it um so this is stuff that i already knew but now it makes it quicker and easier and now because you can watch stuff going on you go oh i need a color change i need an action change i need this with no movement on the tail i need this with more movement on the tail etc cetera, etc cetera. and so and so that's really the thing you know with it now I, this whole show i didn't want this whole show to be uh you know a, a forward facing sonar show mm -hmm. um but the reality of it is is that um, I want to talk a little bit about reservoirs and, and for all the guys complaining about snow and the weather that we're having up here, um, this is going to, this is going to help you guys immensely. The guys farther down South, this already took place because you guys, a lot of you guys are already getting fish spawning, getting fish, you know, coming into spawning beds. So this is a little late for you guys. Um, but, but it's, what's that saying <laughs> there's going to be a whole new language of sounds from frank that oh, yeah. Will be... yeah well yeah. I, i'm running an old all track so it's going to be <laughs> when the motor moves <laughs> but anyhow but um so where the hell was i oh yeah so so what's going on so so we, we're getting this cold snap and i'm gonna i'm gonna tell you a story about a tournament i fished um several years ago i fished a small bass club because a buddy of mine wanted me to um i really didn't have time to do it they have way too many events um but i said okay you know what i mean i'll i'll, I'll pop in a few of them so i i i go to this one and my boat for this lake we were on it was a nine nine limit horsepower limit so i had to be on my trolling motor the whole time so there was no way on earth that i was going to be able to cover any kind of real water and get back okay because i was going to burn my batteries to nothing so when i went out there i took one day and practiced and and the i picked a section of the lake that had a lot of what I was going to look for. And it was, it was literally like the first of April. So I picked a lake that had a section that had a lot of things that I could go through. And then once I started to get bites, then I could look at the lake and go, okay, I need to go here, 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 and here. And then in the tournament time, I wouldn't waste a lot of electric motor juice you know, trying to cover water, I would just go to specific places. So as it stood, we had a very warm spring. And two weeks prior to that event, the bass, a lot of the bass went to the first smallest pockets, not the major creek arms, the first smallest pockets off the main lake. I didn't know this, okay, because I'd never been there before. And I only practiced two days before the event. So, so all these bass went into these shallow pockets. And the guys that went two weeks ahead of time to practice found all these fish in these shallow pockets. When I went out to practice, the first shallow pocket I went to, nada. So I'm like, I got to fish another shallow pocket because maybe that one's just not right. So I go into another shallow pocket nada so i'm like okay i gotta look at i have to look at i call it steeper and deeper okay um i, I gotta look at 45 degree 60 degree banks that have some form of spawning habitat to the left or to the right of them mm -hmm. because i have to be i it's spring so i have to be close to a spawning area but the fish aren't there yet okay so I start looking at these steeper banks and, and I'll never forget this because this was this was like when the Zoom Super Fluke first came out. Ooh. So 
I, I'm I'm out there and I, there's a blowdown hanging off of a, a pretty steep rocky bank, a blowdown hanging off of it. And I I pitch the fluke up on the bank and I'm working it out, you know, and I and I can see I can see it. There's about four foot of visibility in this lake. Then I and I'm looking at it and I'm watching it. I'm staring intently at it. I'm watching it go through the branches and everything else. Well, I don't catch one on it. So I throw back up there to the other side. This time I go, I got to fish the invisible part of it, the part where I can't see the bait. I let it go deeper and I'm just working it real slow. I can't see the bait at all. Okay. I, I fished it where I could see it as deep as I could see it. I fished it. Now I got to go deeper than I can see it. I, I don't get, I get just to the ends of the branches on the tree and my rod loads up and I lean in on it and it's a four pounder. So I'm like, holy crap. They got to be suspending out of these trees over these river channel banks. So I, st I started looking and I said, there's a river channel bank over there. It's got four leaners on it. I got to go fish those blowdowns. I go over there, do the same thing. Doink, I get another one. Doink, I get another one. So now I'm like, okay, hooks off, screw locks on, weight the thing so I can get it down there. And I go start bopping around all these blowdowns. And I, I don't even know how many I had on in practice because I, I only hooked a, a small amount, like three or four the whole day. Now I got, now I got to get back to the ramp and I, and I can't use my outboard. So I'm, I'm almost 100% completely out of battery juice. So for the tournament, I said, okay, I'm going to go here here and the farthest point away that i can go is probably here and still get back so i said to the tournament director i said hey on your way in i said make sure you find me because i will not have battery power so on your way in you have to find me because you got to tow me in and i and i talked to the guy who was running the event because he has to be the first one in so i didn't give a crap what my what my time to be in was I just needed someone to tow me in because I know that I'm not going to have it. Mm -hmm. Well, the reality of it is, is I blow the thing out. I win it like, like, like completely like, and it would have been even bigger because I lost one about five and a half pounds right before I had to come in. So I would have even won by a bigger margin. So anyway, I, when I got in, and weighed in and yay one yay hooray um i i had a couple of my buddies that said two weeks ago dude we, we were catching 20 to 30 out of every pocket he said it was unbelievable and i and i i had no way of knowing that right because i didn't go there till a couple days prior so so then so the, so so here's what i learned okay because it's all about learning right Let's say I would have gone two weeks earlier and I did find those fish in the pockets, right? Then go back for the event and the fish are gone, right? Where's your adjustment going to be? So mine from just my experience would have been to start fishing my way out of those pockets onto the main lake to see where the fish were at because, you know, because... They were up there two weeks ago. Now they're not. They didn't They didn't just go to the middle of the lake because they want to be there. They're going to go there to spawn. Mm -hmm. So they're not too far away. So that's what I would have done. All right. But a lot of these guys just thought that the pocket they were in, the fish left, and they're going to be in another pocket. And so they pocket jumped the whole day, and none of them came in with a limit. None of them. So so that was the that was the learning curve, you know what I mean? So I knew that at this point in time on certain reservoirs that are not predicated around grass, this is a very stable pattern this time of year. So the guys that are getting snow right now, look for the steeper, deeper, and you're going to find the fish as long as you're close to where they want to spawn. Because they're not going to be, this time of year, they're not going to be a million miles from where they want to go lay eggs. They're going to be very close to it. I mean, like very close to it. So that's a really 
a really good, you know, hint on what you need to do in some of these reservoirs in this section of the country. You know, now it applies, it applies down south, mm-hmm. but it's already past that. You know what I mean? It's already beyond that. That's good. But yeah, I just thought it would be, I just thought it was interesting, you know? So, you know what I did do? I forgot I had a drawing. (laughs) (laughs) I completely forgot about it because I got so into it. But okay, so the steeper and deeper, all right, is right here. Mm -hmm. You have a main lake spawning area here and you have a pocket mouth here. All right. So this was very, uh, this was very obvious for me. Mm -hmm. And so this is what I focused on that entire day. I just went wherever there was places for the fish to spawn. I just went to the closest steeper and deeper and then looked for the blowdowns because I know from past experience that a really good early, early pre-spawn pattern, it's not really true Mm pre-spawn in spring that the ends of these trees that are hanging over the break line, this is where the fish are going to stage first before they go here and before they go here. So it was kind of, it was kind of, it was kind of obvious. Dude, hold that up again. Have I ever shown, so in 19, I fished the Toyotas and I fished Kentucky Lake and it was in April. Have I shown that video of where I finished? I had one fish the first day, four fish the second day, finished 30th out of 180 and cashed a check on with five fish. Like that's how brutal it was. But literally there was a bank that looked identical to what you're holding up with a spawning pocket right off of the main lake with two lay downs on rock. And I caught every single fish on a three quarter ounce war eagle off of that 30 yard stretch that I fished for hours and hours and hours. You never showed it. Do you have it? Just out of yeah, curious. I'm pulling it up right now. Like it's it's identical to what you just described. It was pre-spawn. There's a cold front. In practice, I caught the fish out of the back of the pockets on a trap. Mm-hmm. I went back the first day. I threw a trap for seven hours. I caught one keeper for two and a half pounds. I had nothing else. I went back the second day. I started on that. I caught him on it. Yeah. Uh uh. Uh, let me see. I got to pull it up. So while you're pulling that up, I'll do a little, I'll do a little promo. I got a color on the paint shop right now. Um, it's called burnt orange. It's a bandit 200 burnt orange. It's on the paint shop right now. Limited run, obviously, cause it's the paint shop. But if you're a 200 bandit fan, that's a beautiful spring crop pattern burnt orange lurenet.com and of course btl24 see i'm stalling for you matt was that a good stall (laughs) that was a good stall so no no audio but this is a perfect example of what you just described i think unless i've got it completely wrong all right here's the video so this is practice this is a shallow spawning cove right here and i'm i'm throwing a trap Right. And I mean, they're absolutely choking it. You can see it's cold. Another spawning deal. So there's a fish that I caught in practice off of that one stretch. Watch, you'll see this stretch right here coming up. So this is practice. So I'd caught him on that. I'm like, oh, I'm like, oh, why am I using a white rod there? I'm like, that's disappointing. <laughs> so then I catch him. But you can tell, like, see the flat stuff like that? And look at how this fish is eating this trap. I'm like sitting there going, oh, wow, this is insane. And so you- first, so I get, I get to the tournament. It's like calm. I catch one fish. Here's me going, oh, God, I didn't catch him at all. I don't know what I'm going to do today. <laughs> Here's me describing more how I don't know what I'm going to do today. So anyway, I'd been fishing that. It was all gravel. Now watch. There we go. Watch. uh, Watch what I end up fishing. I'm telling my guy. Look at that bank. Oh, yeah, that's it. It literally has lay downs on it. It's in the back of spawning coves. Everything. I'm chucking it. I'm saying like, oh, 
God, Lowe, this looks good. They should be here. Oh, yeah, dude. Steeper, deeper. It's 100%. It was the only section of steeper, deeper in the entire part of the lake. Right by the spawning pockets. Yep. Yeah, there's proof right there. Good video. Good video call. Yep. So here's another one. This is the exact same stretch. Look at that. There's the lay down right there. Going into the water. Boom. Yeah, perfect, dude. There's that another a, one. That was a nice fish, by the way. Yep. Anyway. But that did that look exactly like your diagram? Oh yeah, it was. It was it's the exact thing. <laughs> In the same time of year. That I yeah, did that it. that's that's the key. That's the key. The key thing is to understand um when what time of year these things play out, you know, because if if it's later in the year, you may catch a few there, but most of them are going to want to be fan in beds. So you're going to you're going to be passing up the, the bigger percentage of fish population. Mm -hmm. So you always want to put the percentages in your favor. And then I have one more video that I pulled up to demonstrate the 2D when you were talking about dropping them on drop it on them on, oh, yeah. on the 2D. Have I showed the one that I had from Hartwell? I don't believe. Okay. We'll we'll play this one too just God, to... I, I wish I had some of my 2D sonar stuff, man. Okay, watch this. Are you are you is this is this impressive? All right. This was the open a couple years ago on or two years ago on Hartwell. It's <clears throat> smoked a d shot there but this is i can't afford it because it was like a short that bassmaster used gotcha so watch this you can uh, tell me if i got this dialed in so there's my bait right there going down there's the fish right. on the bottom i reel back in you can see me drop it back down shake it by bait under the fish there's the fish right there there they are together i hop my bait right there and i hook the fish right there yeah dude that's money <laughs> is that That's not cool funny. yeah it's fabulous i was really proud of myself on that one but, but, but this to... is this again this is what i'm this is what i'm saying you know um the 2d sonar used to be our eyes it still is today and forward facing sonar is our eyes but now instead of looking down we get to look out so i mean it's just it's a tool that as an angler, um, you have to get proficient with it. If you're a professional tournament angler, you better be good at it. Um, and if you're an angler that wants to learn and you have it, you have to you have to start to master it. Just like you just like you did with your 2D, your side imaging, your 360. Do do you need it as an as a as an everyday angler? Do you need forward facing sonar? The answer is no. You've caught them prior to having it. You'll still catch them without it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, you don't need it to catch fish, but if you have it, you have to master it because it's like any tool of the fishing game. You master your equipment. You, 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 you know, you, you, you practice casting a million times in your backyard um, when you got a bait caster because you have to master it. Um, mm -hmm. Any technique that you're not good at, you go out and you apply that technique whenever it's applicable so you can master it. Um, it's, there's no, it's no different. It's a tool in the arsenal, and it, I don't think it should be – I don't think it should be frowned upon – um, I think it should be embraced, but I think with forward facing sonar comes the anglers that must have a, a, a little bit more responsibility with it when it comes to the put and take fisheries, like the eaters, like crappie and panfish and walleye and stuff mm -hmm. like that. Here's I, a beautiful thing about the show, Frank, and I didn't mean to cut you off, no, but you're this is what you're dancing around. We are not uh, here on day four to discuss what it should be at the top level of professional fishing no. and how it's going to, this show is about education and catching more fish and enjoying your time on the water and putting right. you in a better area to succeed and selling stuff on lure net. 
Hey, we're being honest. <laughs> <laughs> and and my signature series shirts, which I and the BTL signature and, series T-shirts. There it is, at, uh, Frank. Uh, <laughs> available at basso.com. Shop BTL tab. Uh, I got it wrong. The store is open through the fourteenth. Oh, good. Uh, and that's it. So an extra week. Get on there. That's a, a a shirt that you've washed numerous times. Zero shrinkage on it. No, I, I've watched it. Two, zero two, shrinkage two is times. Good. Yeah, zero shrinkage, which is which is always a plus. And the thing is, the collar mm -hmm. is like brand new. Yeah, I, I I won't mention the brand name, but I I bought a brand name, a bunch of brand name tees, and um, I'm completely annoyed because I've I'm on the third wash on some of them because I just got them, and the collar's all wavy and wrinkly, and quite frankly, the shirt looks like a POS. So it's now it's my they're my painting shirts. So when I paint, I wear those. So when I ruin them, I don't give a damn. Yeah. Uh, and while you're there, also uh, pick up a uh, Bass Talk Live and St. Jude Bass Fishing Saves Life t-shirt. 100% of those proceeds go to St. Jude. Yeah. That I also have. through the 14th as well. I will say, you know, shipping's like eight, nine bucks. The more you get, the less it is. If you just get one thing, I can't, I can't change that. I apologize. Right. I know it sucks. I've ordered stuff where I'm like, damn, shipping's eight bucks, nine bucks on that. It is yeah. what it is. Anyway, long story short, before I cut you off or before we got on this, my whole point was this is not a divisive topic no. at all, especially no. on the show. We're not mm -hmm. here to debate that. What you have learned that you're saying is, hey, here's a tool that can help you learn more can help you understand the environment more. It has right. nothing to do about, oh, it doesn't take skill. It has to do about enjoying your time on the water and catching bass and learning. Those are right. That's all it has to do with. And I think no one can deny the fact that forward-facing sonar enhances all of those things should you choose to use it. So that's why we're incorporating into the show not to be controversial in any way, shape, or form. No, absolutely not. Uh, in, fact, uh, in fact, to be honest with you, I'm staying out of all that fray. Um, yep. I have very good friends of mine that are uh, professional anglers that lit me up one side and down the other at the classic um, because our viewpoints were a little bit different on it. Um, and they made very valid points. To be honest with you, they could have they could have convinced me otherwise. Their points were very valid. Um, mm -hmm. But. I want to learn and I want to continue to grow. And so that's where my take is on it. Um, I love, I love finding out new things about fishing. I love, you know, I love advancing my knowledge of the, of the animals, of the sport, of the environment. Um, and, and it's helping that for me. Uh, you know, there's a lot of things that I knew from past experiences, clearly, this reinforces some of it. Some of it, it proves me that there's other options. Um, and so that's, that's the whole thing. No, I'm not going to be, I'm not going to be a, a scoper where I'm going to jump in my boat and never make a cast until I see something. That's not who I am. That's not how I'm going to be. I'm going to use it to enhance the way I fish because for me, that will make me more successful and it will help me learn more. Um, you know, the only time you'll see me out in the middle of a lake uh, scoping is if I'm crappie fishing or it's the middle of winter and I'm trying to catch a couple of big ones, big bass. Um, otherwise, you'll see me. It'll look you won't even know it. You'll look it'll look like I'm fishing normal, you know, the way everybody else grew up fishing. Um, but it's a tool and um, I think it has a lot of good points to it. And I can see I can see some of the points that some of the guys are making against it. I can't say I don't see those. You know, I, I see their arguments. I don't necessarily agree with all of them, but some of them are pretty good. Some mm -hmm. of them are not. You know what I mean? Um, mm -hmm. <clears throat> so that's it. I'm not trying to make this controversial. It's not going to be me against them or me against him um, or her. It's just it's just the way it is. I mean. You know, I'm just talking factually about it. Um, I think the guys that are doing the put and take fisheries have to be a little responsible with it, with it, because on some of the smaller bodies of water, I absolutely 100% see how you can go in and devastate a crappie fishery of 
a certain size class of fish. Mm -hmm. Um, you're never going to, you're never going to take all the crappie out of a fishery because they reproduce like mad. I mean, they're, you know, crappie, in my opinion, were made to eat and they reproduce like they're made to eat. So, but, but you know what I mean? You can't be greedy either. Um, you know, so you got to be responsible. That's all. Anything else on lure net? Um, let me, let me ease. Oh, uh, devil's horse. If you're down in Florida, there's a new, new color of that. Yeah. It's a cool color too, for, especially for that region. Um, so I you, think this I, is your color. I, yeah. I was busy looking at something. Go back to the burn orange. I'll pull the video up. Yeah, that's it. This is one that you painted though. Oh yeah. There's going to be a whole ton of colors coming out in the paint shop that I painted. Um, I don't want to say all of them, but I'm going to say almost all. Of them. <laughs> I've been a busy lad the last few times. I like it. Yeah, it's a really cool color. I have I actually have the original right here. Um so you guys can see the original one. Cuz so that's what that every single one of those is based yeah, off of. Right. Right. A vintage Bandit 200. Yeah, dude. God, man. Remember when that if you didn't have them you weren't fishing. Yeah, we've done like whole reminiscing segments on it. Yeah, it's just my biggest just... tournament bass ever, Bandit 200 94. Yeah. Yeah, dude, I can't even believe it. I, I I remember the the biggest thing I remember. I was on Pickwick, and I was talking to a buddy of mine who doesn't fish anymore. But I was talking to a buddy of mine, and and one of my one of my bandits, the eye busted off on it. And I said, dude, you think it'll they'll still catch him with the eye missing? <laughs> he goes, he goes, you throw that blind bastard at him, they'll eat it. <laughs> Yeah, they probably they probably scarfed it down. Oh, they choked on it, dude. I I was fishing shallow gravel bars in the mouths of uh, pockets because um, it was early in the year, and I was fishing these gravel bars, and it was just unbelievable, man. It was so much fun. He was actually he actually locked up to Wilson and was paralleling bluffs, catching his paralleling bluffs. So that could that could show you how on the same time of year in different bodies of water. There can be different things happening. What else you got? That's it, man. I'm, I'm, uh, I don't want to say I'm talked out, but you know, I enjoyed that show. Yeah. I, that, was, I, that was a good one. That, that flowed very smoothly and, and a lot of different things from a lot of different aspects of fishing, uh, kind of. Well, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it was, you know, I didn't know how it was going to go. Cause all I, all I did was I had, five bullet points <laughs> yeah I didn't, oh. know, I didn't know where i was gonna go uh probably yes. should talk about this before the show we do have a how many do we have that you have signed five so we do have five mm -hmm. of the color number sevens from the classic we're gonna give away one of those every week uh let's do starting the next five weeks. Okay. And we'll do, uh, three for the live show people and then two for YouTube comments. But I totally forgot about that. This well, morning. Well, you want to do, can... let's do six. We'll do three. And you three. have six. Yeah, I have six. Okay. We'll so yeah, do... that gives us the next month and a half. So every week it'll either be, uh, a comment, that just randomly sticks out to us next week. And I'll just put the little stars next to them. And then we can pick one at the end of the show. And then that'll be three weeks. And then three weeks will be the most insightful, uh, YouTube comment. All right. That'll work. So, because we got to give the people that are watching it on, um, iTunes and stuff an opportunity. Yeah. Well, if you're watching it on iTunes, uh, do you have seven? Yeah, I can. I have seven. I you do have seven. Yeah. Well, let's do seven. Let's do three live because it is color number seven. Let's do three live, two YouTube, and two iTunes reviews. All right. Three live. Yeah. Two YouTube. And two iTunes reviews. And, and then, we'll just rotate them. Yeah. Okay. I'm cool with that. Perfect. <laughs> That's a fair point by 
SBD fishing. He goes, Beach, I should consider more interaction with the chat. I throw, so on day four, I throw a lot of the chat questions up just because it, 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 I think it adds a lot to the show. He said, maybe a little five or 10 minute portion to answer questions at the end. I think that's a, that's a valid point. Like at the oh, end, yeah. like, Hey, you got anything else? And you say no. And then be like, all right, rapid fire questions. I think we should do that on every day for actually. Yeah. So, I mean, we got almost 300 people on live here. Let's do a little five, five minute question I, and, and answer. I learn. I love it because it was so much fun at both classics last year and this year's classic. It was so much fun actually um, meeting the fans. Um, it, the interaction was fantastic. And I would like to have more of that you know, on the show. In fact, we got a show coming up two actually two shows coming up, which I'm not a hundred percent sure on the dates yet, but, um, everybody knows that, that Todd and I made the five blade prop. And, um, I met with Todd's father yesterday. Um, we're going to keep the drive alive. We're going to continue on with the program. Um, Hydromotive is not going anywhere. Cause it was, I, obviously it was, um, Todd's father's mm -hmm. name is Tom. It was Tom's business that he started. And then Todd came on board later on. Um, so the hydromotive engineering is going to stay um, continuing to do everything that they did forever. Um, and we're going to still do the five blade. You know, we're still offering the rough water prop um, and everything's going to be the same. But I'm going to have Tom on a show. Um, I got a bunch of DMs of people that wanted to understand how a prop was designed, the thought process that went in it, how it's made, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm going to have Tom come in and, and actually show you some of the wax molds and, you know, all the stuff. It's really kind of, it's really cool. Um, and it, it'll surprise you how it's done. Um, so I want to, I'm going to have him there. And then of course we'll field questions and answers mm -hmm. on your bass boat, your performance, um, you know, all that stuff. So that'll be a really good interactive show. And then um, I'm doing a show um, probably in a couple of months, maybe a month. I'm going to do one on uh, trailer maintenance. Um, since I had nothing but, since I had nothing but problems um, with my old trailer, um, I didn't own the boat originally. Um, and the trailer was just completely ignored. Mm -hmm. Um, so I am going to do a trailer show on how to avoid some of these long-term problems down the road. Um, because I think it's important. Um, I believe that the trailer is probably the most neglected piece of equipment as an angler that we own. And it should be first and foremost, since it's towing your boat everywhere. So, um, we're going to do that too, coming down the pipe. And then remember, um, th this burnt orange 200, it's pretty sick. So just remember <laughs> that. I have to say that because I'm excited. Because I know my I got like a pile of like some that made it and some that don't, but all the, all like just the Frank colors because you've sent me some. And oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I just, there's so, I, I have been, <laughs> I've been painting for, I've been painting so many baits for, for so long that they're all starting to come out now. So it's going to be fantastic. Um, it's, they're not going to be like intermittently dropped. <laughs> they're just going to start showing up. So, uh, all right, let's hit a couple of these questions that we talked about. Let's uh, do then, it. We'll, then we'll wrap things up. So Nick wants to know if the steel heading helps you understand bass fishing and heavy river currents. hundred percent. Um, Jacob, Wheeler was on the other day with you and he was talking about a buddy of his that just understood river currents like crazy. Dustin, right? Was it Connell who won the run the yeah. interest? Yes. It might've yeah. been. Yeah. Okay. So learn how to recognize an eddy. Where is that eddy in comparison to the structure or obstruction that's making that river current change direction? How far away from it does that eddy occur? Is it right up against it? Is it 10 feet behind it? And so mm -hmm. what you what you notice then is the, the, the more stark and steeper the structural element is, the, 
the closer to it the eddy is. The more the flatter it is, the more gradual it is, the farther back the eddy is. So that gives you the ability to go, well, there's there's where the current changes, but the eddy for this one's going to be back here because it's more gradual. So it it teaches you that kind of stuff. So absolutely. Uh Little Rich would like to know which Smithwick Rogue color best imitates a rainbow smelt. I would probably go with two of them. I would go with foil blue and foil green, um, only because that smelt, um, his re its reflection characteristics are going to change somewhat based on um, water color and clarity and time of year. So you're going to and sun penetration, sunlight penetration. Yeah. So I, I would say those would be the two uh, best effects colors there. We've done shows on spoons. We've done shows on blade baits. Uh, Scott would probably know what number that is on the BTL index. You can also go to the BTL YouTube and look it up. But just quickly, blade bait versus spoon versus tail spinner. This time of year, I mean, we're throw a lot of guys are still throwing those up north. Yeah, I mean they're kind of it's kind of they're kind of different. Interchange it, yeah. Um, like I like I'll slam the bot. I'll I'll use a spoon and I'll actually bang the bottom when the bass are on the bottom. Mm -hmm. uh, um, but the blade bait would work better in that specific presentation. Uh, the tail spinner. Um, I'm gonna yo-yo a tail spinner, hop it up and down. And to be brutally honest with you, I'm not a I don't throw the tail spinner anymore as much as I used to. I used to throw it a lot. Um, but as techniques advance, um, there's better opportunities. Um, does, but uh, go ahead. Do they just Pradco make a tail spinner? Just a little George? Is that, not, that's not it? The little George was, I used to throw the, the little George back in the day. And then there was a, a more modernistic version that came out. Um, and I believe at one time, I think Pradco used to make it. So they, um, they don't have like a tail spinner. I don't believe they do. I looked it up and all it is is walleye trolling spinners right now. <laughs> exactly. Uh, there's a number of different ones. The best, I, I, I like the, uh, the discontinued Wahoo one that was like a dollar 90 at the, tackle store and it was a line through yeah the line through is pretty cool mm -hmm. um line through is a little tricky because um you know if you if you if you snap your hook off you, you're losing the bait but if you snag it that bad you're losing the bait anyway um, yeah it's usually, called a wing ding usually with a tail spinner if you snag it up if you get directly over top of it straight up and down and just mm -hmm. start shaking like that, where you can feel the head of the lure banging on something, you can knock it free. Same thing with a jigging spoon. I rarely lose a jigging spoon. Uh, because the weight of it. Go ahead. That's what I was going to say. You, you've you shown your box, your jigging spoon box, oh, all yeah. of that stuff in past shows. We've done entire day fours on those. So go back and watch that. Yeah, it's pretty cool. My spoon box is easy. I love it. <laughs> yeah. And if anybody has a uh, three quarter ounce wing dings or even half or five eighths in the package, slide into my DMS. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm, tra I'm tracking on the three quarter ounce dude. Yeah. But, but the wing ding, the OG wing ding. Yeah. I'm in tracking like the on three quarter shad color. Um, Were there any sleeper Pradco baits at the classic? Andy wants to know that. I mean, I would have to say they weren't sleeper, but it would have to be the. I would say Gray Lakes finesse. Gray probably, Lakes finesse. Yeah. Yes. That was probably the biggest uh, surprise at the classic was Gray Lakes finesse. That, that whole, it's a whole fishing system in reality, um, but very effective. All right, let's bring the music in. Let's get back to normal. You hate being on that side, so there you are here on this <laughs> again. I mean, you do like that's. I it do idiot. hate it. I hate it being on the other side. Uh, BTL merch last week of sales. The Uncle Frank signature series line of apparel. Uh, this is the 
this is when it will be available. Uh, we'll have a Uncle Frank hat that will come out months, like five, six months from now. It's actually a really cool patch hat that, that kind of goes along with the t-shirt. But uh, you guys asked for it. We got the apparel. Really good feedback. I actually have like a little app right now that tells me how the, how the store's doing. Because we try to do this like once a year. I think it's been like a year and a half since we've had anything. But if you guys have any questions uh, about that apparel, let me know at Matt Pangrek on Instagram or Matt at Basso.com uh, on the email. And I'd be happy to answer any of those. Also, uh, the limited number in the paint shop uh, of the new Bandit 200. Burnt orange. There's 300 of those, right? That's, yes. Yeah, that's it. Yes. And then they're gone. And then starting next week, one of these for the next seven weeks, color number sevens, will be given away. So good job, Frank. I think you covered that topic incredibly well as best as best i could <laughs> yeah hit the thumbs up on uh youtube if you're not subscribed subscribe to the youtube channel uh i think i've covered all the bases right yeah dude you nailed it man all right same place same time next week another day for btl returns to regularly scheduled programming next monday April 8th at 8.30 a.m. Central Time. Remember at the Classic this year when that little kid screamed out, BTL, coming at you. Yeah, he came up. He he found me just so he could let me know that. Dude, you should have recorded that. We could have used it. (laughs) It it is. It's on my my Instagram. Outstanding. (laughs) I have it. I I literally opened with it. Here. Uh, uh, I could turn this down just for a second. Courtney did an, a fantastic job of documenting all things at the Bassmaster Classic. Yeah, she was a uh, trooper. I'm going to have to stop it immediately because then it goes into a song. But listen. Say, BTO, coming at you. <laughs> <laughs> that kid was so happy to do that, dude. <laughs> he was. It was It was awesome. Yeah, it was fabulous. Man. <laughs> uh, made my day. And then he was just exuberant about it. Such a happy dude. I was actually... I really like to see how many uh, how many kids were at the class. Now, some of them, I'm sure, did not have a choice in listening, just like some of the wives that came up and were like, oh, right. you're, you're the individuals that I'm forced to listen to every time we're in the truck. Correct. But there are a lot of the kids that were like all about it, like fish, oh, yeah. fish the junior club, listen to the podcast, watch the YouTube stuff. That was cool. Yeah, there was I was really pleased with the with the um, the age range was yep. was really incredible and male female range was incredible too well um, i mean you just you naturally frankly I mean, you're going to bring them in dude there there's there's nothing up here anymore you're no going to bring them in nothing. you know what i'm saying i got I, there never mind <laughs> but there's some guys that some guys that just look naturally good no, without ha- hair on their head like yeah i mean you don't have like a lumpy head it, it shaves night you know what i mean like i you should have a guy I, I should have a lumpy head as many times as I've fallen at it. <laughs> I think we just ended on that right there. I think so. It's over. <laughs> All right. This has been another edition of BTL Day 4 with the man Frank Scalish. We'll talk to everybody on Monday. See ya.